Okay, let's go ahead and uh, pick up where we left off. So we were talking about diffusion. And so we're looking at some of the functionality of the cell and the cell membrane. And so when you take a look at diffusion, basically the way you define diffusion is essentially the movement of molecules, typically solute molecules, from an area of higher concentration to lower concentration. So it's a downhill process, right? And typically you're going from a high energy state, which is high concentration, to a lower energy state, which is a lower concentration. Um, and you do this until everything is equal. So for instance, um, this is a type of um, movement that's referred to as passive, passive movement or passive transport because it doesn't require energy because it's a downhill process, right? So when you take a look at it, if you were to look at, say for instance, the concentration of molecule X being very high on one side, being very low on another side, basically that represents a concentration gradient, which is fairly steep if there's a large disparity between those two points. So this is gonna be a very fast diffusion. If those two points are a little bit closer together, that is to say that the high is not quite as high as the low, then you're gonna have a bit of a shallower slope. So this is not as fast. And then ultimately, if your two concentrations are pretty much equal to each other, then you don't have any diffusion at all. And so this is basically, you know, kind of like a, a river system, right? So a river system will always move from a high to a low, it moves from a high energy gradient, which is on the top of the mountain, to a low energy gradient to its lowest point. So it always rolls from high to low. And then when it settles at the low, it's just basically just kind of a dead system, kind of a lake at the bottom, essentially. And so there's no more uh, net water flow, water movement. And so typically at this particular point, it's called equilibrium. Um, you still have movement of water. You just don't have any net movement, right? So just like if you take a look at a, at a stream or a, a, a snow melt stream that's going from a high peak and sort of draining down into sort of a, a shallow lake, once it hits the lake, it looks like the lake uh, is the water, the molecules aren't moving, but they are moving. It's just that there's no net movement. So if you already take a look at a or tag a specific water molecule, you'll see it actually circulating throughout that lake. So the water molecules themselves are still milling about. It's just that you're not either adding to or taking away from that particular system because they're equilibrium. So there's no net movement. Um, and so ultimately when you have a disparity between those two, then you'll get movement again, right? So the reason why a lake is kind of placid or equilibrium is because it's at a level, it's at a kind of a leveling area. As soon as you tilt that, then you're going to get another gradient and it's going to start flowing from high to low again, right? So um, we do this every time we pour something off into a glass. We're just basically creating a gradient. And so they move basically wherever you want them to move, depending on where that gradient is pointed. So for instance, if I wanted to move things to the back of the room in the far corner, I would just take my gradient and I would tilt my gradient and point it in that direction and everything would move in that direction. If I wanted to move over here, then I would just change my gradient and point it in this direction and I would tilt it and then it would basically roll in that direction. Um, some of you have kind of played those like little kind of steel ball maze games where you kind of like tilt the, you know, kind of you, you, know, you tilt your little, your little table or something like that and try to get the little steel ball through your maze and stuff like that. You're doing the exact same thing. What you're doing is you're creating and you're redirecting the ball by using a gradient. In this case, it's a gravitational gradient, but it's the same basic idea. And that's essentially what happens in the body itself. So it's kind of what it looks like. So here you can see um, two different conditions. One is at equilibrium, and the other one is kind of initial. So here, basically, what you have um, is a situation where um, you've got water on one side and the concentration or the solutes on another side. Now, there is a little bit of a, um, of, a, of a mistake on this one because I think what they did, there's a bit of a typo, if you will, or actually kind of a graphical O on there is because if you take a look at the nature of the solutes, which are the little purple particles, the solutes basically, if you take a look at them closely on this side, are at a low concentration. 
clearly there's fewer of them over on this side than there are on this side. This is a much higher concentration over here. And you can see that by just counting them, right? So as a result, which direction do you think those solutes are gonna to wanna to go? From high to low. That's not what they have here, is it? So technically the solutes should be going and moving from in that direction. That's the way they should be moving. The water then should be moving the opposite direction because when we take a look at osmosis, we'll see this in the next slide. Water tends to chase the high concentration of solute. So water being these little red fly-like molecules should be going in the opposite direction. And so that's kind of what, um, that's kind of a little bit um, confusing here, but that's basically what's happening. So they're, it looks like they're trying to show the opposite effect um, where they have the solutes going that way. And that's not the way they would go. They want to come in because you go from high to low. Okay. Until of course, everything becomes equilibrium. At this point, everything is equal on both sides. There's equal number of water molecules on each side. There's an equal level of equal number of solute molecules on each side. And so that's basically how that works. Now, typically you have osmosis and diffusion happening at the same time. Osmosis simply is the diffusion of water. And generally speaking in Mater, she likes to sort of define it as moving from a high to a low water concentration. And, yeah, and you can certainly think of it that way if that helps to keep everything uniform in your mind. However, what it actually does is water basically flows and moves toward the high solute concentration. Essentially in osmosis, we have a mantra to help us to sort of understand the nature of the way water moves. And it's basically this, salt sucks. Okay. Think about it for a second. First of all, number one, is water is pretty stubborn, right? I mean, it's really stubborn. You don't get to tell water what to do. Water does what it wants to do, regardless of what you're telling, right? And so our efforts to basically manipulate water are all pretty much in vain. So basically when, you're, when you have your body and you're trying to tell your water to go from here to here, you can basically shout and scream at water all you want. It's never going to budge. Water's not going to listen to what you want it to do. It's going to do what it wants to do, regardless of what you have to say about it. But here's the problem. In your body, osmosis is super, super critical, right? You have to figure out a way to move water. These things are almost immediately annoying. That's chairs in my grade school. Classrooms, I've the kids are being bad or noisy so you get to sit up here in front of the class and have the teacher that's what it just reminds me of so this is going to be over so basically how do we then move water from point a to point b because we have to right if you don't have the ability to move water from point a to point b in your body game over you're you're dead before you even before you even wake up right so how do we do that? Because we have to do that. Well, first of all, one thing we need to understand is that basically water is a beagle, as in the dog, right? Because we used to have a beagle. She got old and, well, just, you know, things happen. You get old and life happens. But my gosh, was this dog a stubborn little thing. Um, I mean, she was absolutely frustrating. Cute as all get out, but frustrating, very confusing. It's like one of those dogs where you kind of almost equally feel like you want to strangle her and kiss on her at the same time. So it's a very, very confusing dog. But Maddie was an incredibly stubborn beagle. And so I learned very quickly that if I say, for instance, had uh, Maddie was up on the bed, snoozing it away, upside down is, is her preferred position. So her little legs kicked up in the air. Now, if it was time to go to bed and it was time for Maddie to go outside and go potty so that she doesn't like, you know, whittle all over the bed all night long, which also was her habit at times. 
right? You got to drain the tank so that you can make it through the night. So here's the problem. I can get up there and I can try with my kindest, sweetest voice to get Maddie to come with me downstairs to go outside and go potty. Was that effective? No, because Maddie didn't really feel like leaving the bed at that point. It was nice and cozy. And so she was much more willing to just stay put right where she was. Now, I could try a different technique. I could start yelling at her, right? Get my most ominous, threatening voice and see if I could scare her into submission. Of course, that didn't work, right? Um, so <laughs> I could try to pick her up and take her out. That was one, one strategy, right? But that's not a good choice. Why? Well, because Maddie, being a beagle, was a little on the hefty side. Um, and not only that, but when you picked her up, she did not like being picked up. So she was always like, you know, all over the place when you picked her up. Now, you got a, a bit of on the heaviest side dog that's squirming all over the place while you're trying to go downstairs, trying to control this flailing overweight dog. You can see what the potential dangers are. Somebody's going to end up at the bottom of the stairs needing to either go to the vet or to the emergency room or both. Now, considering the fact that I would rather sleep at night rather than go to the emergency room at night, that's not a strategy either. So what do we do? How do we get Maddie down the stairs and outside? Very simple. Our next metaphor. Salt is an alpo snap. What's an alpo snap? They're basically little biscuits, little dog biscuits. Very small, not very big, about that big. You don't want to give Maddie a ton because she'll eat herself into a coma. She did once when she got into the biscuits when we were gone. And she was just laying on the floor. Happy, but just completely. It's like, wow, okay. So <laughs> we were surprised there were any biscuits left, actually. The, so she met her limit, the biscuits won. But she enjoyed trying to get to that limit, no doubt. But an apple snap is just basically a little training biscuit. And the one thing that Matt does motivate Maddie was food, right? I mean, she would do anything for food. Now, all dogs are motivated by food. But this particular dog was like psychologically a, a wreck when it comes to food. I mean, literally, she was so motivated by food. And some of you guys probably had dogs like this that I could take that elbow snap and I could walk into the closet and guess who's following me? Maddie, right? I could throw that into the toilet and guess who's jumping into the toilet to get it? I could throw that elbow snap into the jaws of a great white shark and guess who's jumping in after it happily, regardless of whether or not that's gonna be the last thing she does. So she is extremely motivated. So all you need to do is just basically take the correct motivation and the dog is mine to lead out to the backyard. Of course, the deal was I pay her first, and then she gives me. I give her what she wants. She gives me what she wants. Sometimes it didn't work out that way because being the stubborn dog she was, she'd get her biscuit, and then she'd be like, sucker, let me back in, right? And it's like, oh. and here we are out there at 2 o'clock in the morning waiting for Maddie to go potty because you knew as soon as she went inside, it was going to be all over the house. That's just the way she was. Now oh, the joys of dog ownership, right? Many of us probably have been there. But water's the same way, right? There was nothing that I could do that could get that beagle to move and to do what I wanted to do, even though I needed her to go from point A to point B. Water's the same way. You can yell at water, you can scream at water, but guess what? Water does what water does. And there's nothing you can do to change that. Matter of fact, in addition to that, water always wins. Always. How do you know that? Well, some of you guys do that. Well, wait, 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 wait. No, there's at least one case where I think we won, right? Think about it. Hoover Dam. We won that one. We'll show that water what to do. We'll dam up that river. And then we'll create Lake Mead. That's us winning. Yes? No. You know why? Because we're only around for 80 some odd years. Ish. But how long is water going to be around? Yeah, that water's just be sitting there like, okay, you 80-year-old. I'll wait. I'm patient. 
I'll do what I need to do to get my way. Is Hoover Dam going to be there forever? Someday, we're not going to be able to maintain that. And someday, water will slowly chip away at Hoover Dam. And eventually, playing the patient game, it'll break that dam, and then phew, the river will be restored, the ecosystem will rejoice, and guess who won? Water, okay? If you don't believe that water wins, always ask the Grand Canyon who won that one. Water always wins. So basically we have to trick water to do what we want it to do. So how do you get water to move around in your body? Simple, you move the salt around. So if I needed water to move from here back over to here, I don't sit here, waste my time and my breath shouting at water. All I do is I pick up my pile of alpo snaps or my salt in this case, I build a salt gradient right here and then guess what water is naturally gonna do? It's gonna see that and it's gonna chase right after that salt pile. If I needed to come over here, what do I do? I build a salt pile over here. What happens? Water comes right over here. So essentially the way you get water to move throughout your body is by changing the salt piles in your body and causing water automatically, spontaneously chase after. Now, that being said, that of course assumes, and rightly so because we've measured it, two things. Number one, do we have control over where and when and how we put those salt piles? And that's true, we do have control of those. We can do that as much as we want, just like we have control over how many Alpo snaps we buy in order to lure the beagle, right? So we have control over that. The other thing that it also um, illustrates is the fact that your salt concentrations in your body are really critical. They're really important. And so as a result, when we take a look at these concentrations, the environment of saltiness, if you will, around your, around your cells, is a really important environment. And we have basically three different salty environments that we can create. One is basically referred to as the hypo, or excuse me, the isotonic condition. So now in an isotonic condition, what we basically have is a situation where you have iso means same, salt. So what that basically means is the concentrations of your cells is the same as the concentrations of the fluid around your cells. And as a result, there is no disparity. There's no gradient. The salt is the same in and out. And so ultimately, um, you don't have any change in the cell size. Now, in a hypotonic solution, hypo means less than, tonic means salt. In this situation, this is where you have a solution with fewer salts on the outside relative to the inside. So as a result, your cells look salty relative to what's outside. This causes your cells to swell and then ultimately burst, which is always a bad thing, right? You don't want to blow your cells up. And then a hypertonic solution, basically hyper means more than salt. This is a situation where the solution around your cells is very, very salty. Now, in this case, what happens is it dehydrates you. It sucks all that water out of your cells and it causes your cells to shrink that process called crenation. Now then, you notice what we're doing. In all cases, what we're doing is we're using salts or the different salt patterns to get flow of water. For which the flow of water is always responding to these salts. So the force of the water is what's called osmotic pressure. So osmotic pressure is the force of water as it moves in response to these salts sucking it toward itself. So here's kind of what some of the biological outcomes look like. So first of all, for us, these are red blood cells in a beaker and these are actual red blood cells that we see at the bottom. So these are scanning electron micrographs of red blood cells. So in the first situation, we're gonna have the isotonic scenario. In the isotonic scenario, basically this is where your solute concentrations on the outside of the cell are equal to the solute concentrations on the inside of the cell. As a result, water, does not have a gradient to respond to, so it's equally moving into 
and out of the cell happily. So you don't get any net movement of water, but the water molecules themselves are circulating in and out, right? That's kind of what we're referring to. Just like if we have no net flow of students in this room, then the absolute headcount of students in this room will stay the same, even though we ourselves will actually shift in and out. Like for instance, if two people move out, two people move in. Three people move out, three people move in. 12 people move out, 12 people move in. But there's no net flow. The room stays full of the number of students that are in the room, but you guys individually will circulate in and out. Okay. That's what's happening in the isotonic situation. This, by the way, if you're wondering, for the human body, this is where we want to be. That's happiness, right? my advanced smiley face notation system. That's what you want right there. You want to be isotonic. Now, what happens in the others? How about hypotonic? So in hypotonic, this is a situation where the concentration of your solutes on the outside is less than the concentration of the solutes on the inside. So which direction is water going to move at this point? Remember, salt sucks. So the water will move into the cells. So you can see the water basically moving into these cells. Now, what happens when the water moves into these cells, especially in animal cells? What's going to happen? It's like filling up a water balloon. We've all done this before, yes? During the summer, the kid, maybe during the summer, right? Fill up a water balloon to the point where it can't handle it anymore. And then what happens? It lyses, right? So that's what happens. You basically fill these cells will swell. And then eventually what's going to happen is they're going to burst. And that's lysis. So this is what happens when, say, for instance, you put fresh water around a salt water creature. Like if I were to take a salt water fish and put it in fresh water, what happens to it? It's in a hypotonic solution now, right? Its cells, which were supposed to be adapted to ocean water, salty water, are now in fresh water. So now you get this gradient, the salt gradient, right? The fish cells now look salty. So what happens? It sucks the water into those fish cells. They swell up and they blow up and then basically that kills the fish. Okay. So in the hypertonic situation, this is when it's your solute concentrations on the outside are gonna be greater than your solute concentrations on the inside. So which direction does the water move this time? It's gonna move out of the cell, right? So you can see the salty water is sucking all that fluid out of itself, out of the cells themselves, and then they shrivel up. So this is crenation. So you can actually see crenation so to get these like little star-like shapes of cells. So this is basically what happens when you dehydrate. So basically, if you take a look at a hypotonic situation, this is actually worse than not sad. This is, you're dead if it's hypotonic. If you're hypertonic, you're, you're sad, but you can recover as long as you get water into you, right? As long as you fix that, get that salt out of there, um, you can still recover. But if it's hypotonic, you're kind of, you're kind of a little SOL there, right? Because once you blow your cells up, they're gone. And that's not a good thing. So this is like the this is the opposite situation. This is where you're basically taking a freshwater fish and putting it in the ocean. So the ocean, which is going to be saltier than the actual fish's cells, is going to suck all that water out of the fish's cells and to dehydrate. Okay. So this is basically this is really important, right? Because this is this is you, right? Because it's human biology. It's great to talk about fish, right? But this is you, this is the reason why we talk about this, because when you take a look at your physiological buffer, all of your buffers, that's all of your interstitial fluids, the fluids of your cells, the fluids of your blood plasma, all the fluids that are in your body are calibrated and adjusted to be isotonic. That's how we survive. The way we survive in this terrestrial arid environment is we enclose ourselves up in our skin and then we create an internal condition, an isotonic condition that basically bathes our cells. What happens if we do not um, maintain the isotonicity, then we run into one of these two problems, either lysis or crenation. Here's a good example. 
right? We ran into one of these, the hypotonic situation back in the day, about 20 some odd years ago, when the water bottle industry started kicking off and people started really getting into bottled water because the idea was it was pure and there was a push for purity, which is good. But there was an obsessive push for like ultimately molecularly pure water. Like there's nothing but hydrogen and oxygen in this water. And so they would actually manufacture pure water and then they bottle it and they would sell it. And they would basically tell people, it's like, listen, there's nothing in this. There's like just pure water, just hydrogen and oxygen. That's it. Was that a good idea? No, it wasn't a great, a good idea. As a matter of fact, I, I kind of, um, I, I remember these guys in grocery stores trying to sell this stuff and thinking it's like, wow, you guys have no clue what you're selling. It's like, this is not going to be good for your customers. This is going to, it's going to do damage to their body. It's not going to be, it's not going to help them, right? Why? And actually they sold that and they, they learned quickly, by the way. They realized that this was actually hurting their customers, not helping them. Well, why would it? Doesn't pure water sound like a great idea? Why would pure molecular water hurt somebody instead of help them? Yeah. Yeah, so like, it, so what you would be doing is like the middle situation, right? You'd be basically bathing your cells in this ultra pure water, but then it would create your cells with this really kind of out of balance look that your cells would look really, really salty, right? Compared to the water that you have around them. And you'd create this hypotonic scenario where all the water would rush into your cells and it basically burst them. And so people were really good. There is such a thing as water toxicity. So you can't actually drink too much water. It can't actually be toxic. In this case, pure water was toxic because they were disturbing the osmotic balance in your body. Remember, your body is not hypotonic, it's isotonic. And so what we did is we basically had people drinking water that turned them into the hypotonic situation and then their cells started bursting and then they started getting sick. Now what do water companies do? They still sell you the pure water. But what do they do to it before they sell it to you? So they add stuff to it. They add minerals and stuff to it. Calcium, various sorts of things like that, magnesium. So they have to ask it, why? Because your body isn't actually adapted to take on pure water. That's just not what it wants. Your body doesn't want pure water. Matter of fact, as we think about it, the idea of pure water, of clean water, actually, that's uh, forget about pure water. I mean, just like clean, drinkable water is actually a story of only the recent past. Clean water has only been a luxury of the last several generations. The overwhelming majority of human history has basically had to deal with some pretty abysmal water conditions. Let me call. So that's um, something to always keep in mind. Your body is not designed. It's used to this muddy water, this calcium water, this water with lots of deposits and minerals and ions and stuff like that in it. That's what it's designed. That's what, it's, that's what it understands. That's what it was designed and adapted to, to deal with. So clean water, actually, if you think about it, is kind of, your body doesn't really know what to do with it, um, which is sounds kind of crazy, but... That's one of the reasons, by the way, uh, why you see a lot of the things that you see in the past in history, right? One of the reasons why there is lots of dysentery outbreaks and typhoid outbreaks and things like that was because we didn't have the water treatment strategies that we have now. We had nothing that even resembled clean water policy at all. What you basically did was you dumped your sewage into the Thames or into the Seine, since that was a more recent river that we looked at if you guys kept up with the Olympics, right? But then you pulled your drinking water from the same river. And that was pretty common. So as a result, you tend to get high levels of fecal borne diseases like typhoid and dysentery and things like that. 
because you didn't have water treatment back in the day. It didn't exist. You didn't have clean water back in the day. It didn't exist. It's also one of the reasons why Europe has um, such a, how should we say, um, such an alcoholic history, right? Is because if you go to Europe, it's like they have like five year olds drinking beer, right? I mean, it's only the US and our puritanical sort of beginnings that creates an age limit. Um, Europe, you're drinking beer like when you're little. And if you go back into history, it's the same thing. Nobody ever drank water in history. You drank wine or some version of like a fermented grape juice wasn't really quite what we think of as wine, but some sort of a fermented or a hard cider or something like that. That's what you drank from when you were old, from when you were little. Why? Because everybody knew that you don't drink the water. So the idea of drinking water is a pretty recent kind of an idea. That's one of the reasons why we see these disease patterns that we see in the past. It's also the reason why we see our alcohol um, as, as well, the, our alcohol consumption patterns is because nobody drank water. You couldn't drink water. You made beer, which was a little bit safer. Yeah. So that's for all your beer drinkers, right? All your beer drinkers are like, yeah, I knew it, right? Let's lower that age down to two. <laughs> it's like, get those baby bottles full of beer, right? So, but that was the thing, right? Because you could literally, especially when you were little, right? I mean, your immune system still is ramping up. I mean, if you get hit with typhoid when you're little, you're, you're cooked, you're screwed. So it was, it was a dangerous thing, but that's kind of what changed it. But that was all this. That was all associated with a lot of this, right? So this whole idea of clean water, pure water, and so forth. Um, yeah, and this, yeah, and still. Yeah, and well, and still, like when you kind of go into yeah other countries that are not as well developed um, as. It's like don't drink the water, but you 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 pack it, you bottle your own water to make sure it's safe. Because even if it's not typhoid, I mean that's going to get us. That's going to get anybody. But there's still like a lot of local born diseases that there's local immunity to. So you don't see the local suffering from this, but you don't have immunity to it, and so you'll pick it up, but the locals won't because their bodies have been adapted to their dirty water, right? And so there was a lot of that back in the day. But so just drink, you go abroad, drink beer, right? <laughs> so, but that's the reason, that's the reason why there's such a big beer drinking culture and why fermented drinking is something that was a staple, like as far back in the, the history of human, human um, history that we, as we can find. It was always there. And that's part of the reason why. It is a dehydrating thing. Yes, it is. We didn't know it back in those days, but it is a dehydrating thing. So it's a little bit of a balance, right? So, but you can get moisture and uh, water from your food. So as long as you don't like over drink and completely and and completely dehydrate yourself, then you can replace some of those fluids with with the the water that's in like fruit and vegetables and some things like that. So there's water in your food as well. So. Yeah, I mean, it's not ideal, <laughs> right? I mean, it's better to have water treatment plants and things like that, but um, but yeah, that's just the thing because a lot of times people don't think of that. They, you know, they're talking about clean water and all that sort of stuff and like somehow we've had this forever. It's like, um, no, we haven't. Actually, most of the world still doesn't, right? So this is a luxury of a developed society that's only come along in the recent past. So a lot of people don't realize that. Okay, so let's go ahead and then take a look at this. So that's diffusion, right? And so that's just basically stuff moving into and out of um, the cell. There's also another way that you can move stuff into and out of the cell. That's what's called facilitated transport. So facilitated transport is still passive. So you're still going from a high to a low concentration. Only generally speaking, usually what you're using are transporter proteins. So the, you'll need a little bit of help getting through the membrane with facilitated transport. You're not just gonna be able to just scooch through the membrane because the membrane, when you take a look at it, is nonpolar. So this nonpolar tail region, it 
doesn't allow polar molecules to pass. Not going to happen. <coughs> But you still need them, right? Like water, for instance, is a polar molecule that you need. But it's not going to get through this. So if you take a look at water molecules, they're polar. They're not going to get through there. If you take a look at sodium, charged, very polar, it's not going to get through there. Half of the ions that you have and that you need are not going to get through there. So you need some sort of a strategy to get them into your cell because you need them desperately. And that's where the transporter comes in. Basically, a transporter creates safe passage. to allow polar and charged molecules to cross the membrane. Now we see fewer protein carriers. Most of what we see are channels. So if I kind of continue this on, what a channel basically is, is this kind of little tunnel through the membrane itself. And so it'll be specific for its molecule. For instance, if I need to get sodium in, a sodium channel will be made that'll allow sodium to pass in. Kind of like the way Eisenhower tunnel is, right? So Eisenhower tunnel is a channel that is a hole carved into the mountain and it allows safe passage for us to get from one side of the mountain to the other. Otherwise, we couldn't get through that mountain and going over the mountain would be somewhat difficult, right? So we have a hole in it that creates safe passage. And this is kind of the same way transport proteins work. They create safe passage for these polar and non-polar molecules to be able to come in. The other thing also to remember is that these tend to be specific. So transporters are specific to their molecule. So if you need to get water in, you need to create a water channel. If you need to get sodium in, you need to create a sodium channel. If you need to get calcium in, you need to create a calcium channel and so forth. So depending on what you're going after, you have to create a specific channel for it. Okay, so those are the passives. Now, what about the active transporters? So the active transporters are a little bit different. They're still moving solute molecules, so that's still a thing. But in this case, what's happening is they're going from lower to higher. So this is basically now an uphill process. As a result, anything going uphill requires what? Some energy. And our energy comes to us in the form of ATP, right? which we talked about in the macromolecule chapter. That's our little rechargeable cell phone battery that basically allows us the energy that we need in order to move this uphill. So oftentimes, and one of the things in our poster child, typically in, okay, first of all, first things first. All active transporters are carriers, whereas facilitated transport carriers are mostly channels. Because carriers are too limited. A carrier can only grab on to a certain number of molecules and work on it. Whereas in facilitated transport, a channel can allow a whole lot of molecules to come through. But in active transport, they're all carriers. And the poster boy for active transporters is the sodium potassium pump. And the important thing to understand about these active transporters is when you take a look at an active transporter, remember these concentration gradients that we um, enjoy, like for instance, the um, sodium concentration gradient, calcium concentration gradient, right? These things that are moving from high to low, from down, downhill, from a high point to a low point, these don't come for free. Right? These gradients don't just happen. They have to be built. Somebody put them there. That somebody are the active transporters. So the active transporters basically builds the concentration gradients for passive transport. So wherever you see a concentration gradient, 
there's an active transporter somewhere nearby that built that. It's kind of the same idea, right? Somebody goes down a slide. Is that an active or a passive process? You're at the top of the slide. So that's going to be, there's your little slide. Here's you. So going down that slide, is that going to be active or passive? That's passive, right? So as soon as you let go, this spontaneously, you go right on down to the bottom. But guess what? You didn't just get there magically, did you? How did you get up there? We didn't tell you it was on this side of the slide. There's a ladder, right? So guess what you had to do? You had to climb, you had to put some energy into that. Some energy went into you climbing up that ladder. That's an uphill process, yes? So that when you get to the top, it represents a high energy state. And then all you had to do is let go. And then this process becomes passive. So the energy is exiting now as you go down the slide. So you notice you didn't just get born at the top of the slide. You had to get there. So wherever you see a concentration gradient or a system with a lot of energy in it, it didn't just get there for free. Somebody had to build it. Somebody put it there. Or in this case, our active transporter put it there. It built it. So when we are, just like the, just like the Alpo snaps, right? The Alpo snaps didn't just magically appear. I actually had to physically put them somewhere so that they could do the work with the dog, right? So that's an important thing to always remember. These things come in pairs. If I've got a sodium channel that allows sodium ions to flow through it, which is what happens with your nervous system, what that means is I have a sodium potassium pump nearby that builds that concentration gradient in the first place. And this is what the sodium potassium pump does. So you take a look at the sodium potassium pump. It's a carrier, which means it has the ability to grab onto two different molecules um, at this particular point, sodium and potassium. So now when you take a look at the sodium potassium pump, you're gonna notice it has two different types of what's called active site. So an active site, just to kind of define what that is, is a 3D pocket where an enzyme substrate will bind. So the sodium active sites that you see here are basically perfectly fitted for sodium. And so you, you'll see there's three of them. So the sodium potassium pump will grab onto three sodiums. And then what'll happen is it'll dump these three sodiums to the outside of the cell. So you can see these three sodiums that just got dumped to the outside of the cell. Now then, alternately, what it does, once it does that, is it has two more active sites that are specially shaped for potassiums. So while it's dumping the sodiums out, it's gonna pick up two potassiums. And then it changes shape again, and it dumps those potassiums on the inside. At that point then, it picks up sodiums, changes the shape, dumps the sodiums on the outside, and then picks up two potassiums. So what it's doing is basically something kind of like this. Grab onto the sodiums. I have no potassium now because they just dumped up. I'm going to change shape. I'm going to dump my sodiums off. I'm going to pick up my potassiums and then change shape. Dump off my potassiums, pick up my sodiums, and then I change shape. And then I dump off my sodiums, pick up my potassium, and I change shape. And that's basically what you're doing back and forth. So you pick up, dump off, pick up, dump off, pick up, dump off, and so forth. And you just kind of keep doing that over and over again. You do that through multiple cycles, what's gonna happen is on the outside, you're gonna to start to build a sodium concentration gradient. It's gonna be high on the outside, low on the outside. But at the same time, guess what else you're gonna be doing? Because you're moving potassium as well. So you're also gonna be building a potassium gradient at the same time. 
which is going to be the opposite. It's great and going to be high on the inside and low on the outside. All of which the reason why we call it is because it requires ATP in order to energize that. Just like you have an app on your phone that requires your cell phone battery to power it. Right? Same thing, same no idea. So let's go ahead and take a look then at uh, bulk transport. So with bulk transport, we have essentially, it's kind of a little bit different than passive and active transport. In bulk transport, what you're doing is you're, lo you're moving large molecules. So this basically moves macromolecules into and out of the cell. These molecules are too big to go through a channel, right? Because you would just have to put such a big hole in the membrane that it would just basically destroy the membrane of the cell, it would just basically pop, right? So you have to have a different strategy to do this. And so you have two different types. So the process where you have macromolecules going into the cells, what's called endocytosis. So endo means inside, site means cell, and osis means the condition of. So it's a condition of cell inside is actually what that means, right? So in this particular case, what's gonna happen is endocytosis moved by a mechanism that involves the invagination of the plasma membrane. Now, what does that mean? That basically means we have a plasma membrane here and then what's gonna happen is you're gonna get a little bit of a puckering, an inward pucker, that's an invagination that continues to get deeper and deeper and deeper. And then what happens when these two shoulders touch, then it'll just pop off. It'll pinch off just like a, a, a soap bubble kind of pinching off of another soap bubble, okay? And then at this particular point, what happens is inside that little soap bubble-like uh, vesicle, is a bunch of stuff. In this case, it's whatever was out here and whatever you packaged inside that little bubble, okay? There's three main types of transport that we, or bulk transport that we, uh, endocytosis rather, that we see. The first one is called phagocytosis. So phago basically means to eat, site is cell, and osis is the condition of. So this is a condition of cell eating. This is basically when a bacterial cell or excuse me, a white blood cell will engulf or gobble up um, a bacterial cell. So there's other cells that do that, not just your white blood cells. Yeah. Osis, the condition of. Yep. So, um, white blood cells gobble up bacteria. That's how your immune system works. But other cells that aren't white blood cells that are just like regular cells, they'll engulf different types of food particles and things like that. So this is how some cells eat. Okay. But it's all phagocytosis. You're gobbling stuff up. But for us, it's important um, because in chapter seven and eight, we'll look at the immune system. And so that's how your white blood cells gobble up the bacteria. They kill the bacteria by doing that. And then they also are able to display that to your rest of your immune system. So your immune system also kind of trains itself on who the bad guy is um, and who to look out for. Penocytosis, basically, this means to drink. Of course, this means cell and the condition of. This is the condition of cell drinking. So it's a similar mechanism to phagocytosis, only in this case, you're basically taking in small fluid, you know, just a little bit of fluid that's out there on the outside of the plasma membrane. And then the last one, receptor-mediated endocytosis is basically where you use specific receptors in the plasma membrane to grab onto specific types of molecules. And so here's kind of that, how the three of them look. So here's phagocytosis. You can see how you're starting to invaginate the membrane and then gobbling up this particle and then when these two shoulders touch it'll pop off this vesicle and you'll have this little food particle or whatever that happens to be inside of the cell itself. For penocytosis same basic mechanism only in this case it's just whatever happens to be out here so it's just sampling your extracellular matrix and receptor mediated endocytosis is basically a situation where you have receptors 
you know, take a bit of a closer look at that. So here you can see receptors are specifically designed to grab onto this molecule right here. Now, generally speaking, you can tell when you're using this because you're gonna see what's called a coated pit. This little structure right here is a coated pit. It serves as a foundation for you to anchor your receptors into. So they're anchored into that foundation. So that when you pull on this foundation, it'll basically pull in this bubble and it'll create a coated vesicle. So if you were to just pull on one of these receptors, it would basically just rip through the membrane. So you don't want to do that. So that's the reason why you create this coated, this coated uh, pit is to kind of create something that is structurally sound that you can grab onto and pull on and then kind of get these receptors sort of gather them up a little bit without shredding and doing harm to the membrane itself. We see that kind of strategy a lot of times when there's a delicate molecule or a very, um, very easy to break molecule, we'll oftentimes create or build tough structural like handles, if you will, to grab onto so that we can manipulate them and move them without damaging the molecules themselves is an example of that. So all those three mechanisms will move different types of macromolecules into a cell. Now, there's also what's called exocytosis. So this is basically where you're moving stuff um, out of the cell by kind of a reverse mechanism. In this case, you're going to evaginate. Um, that's not true. It's not quite the same as evagination, but you're gonna fuse with the membrane. So it kind of looks at the reverse of endocytosis. Typically, this is how we um, secrete like our neurotransmitters and our hormones. A lot of them are secreted this way. Um, when we secrete a lot of molecules, they're secreted this way with exocytosis. Um, also, the way we get our receptors out there for receptor-mediated endocytosis is with exocytosis um, because the membranes that fuse with the plasma membrane basically will become part of the membrane. So here's what it looks like. So here is our plasma membrane and here's our vesicle that's moving toward the plasma membrane. As it touches, it's going to fuse with the membrane. And when it does, it's going to basically turn the vesicle inside out. So here you can see like maybe neurotransmitters are in there. In this particular case, maybe there's receptors that are in there like that. And then as it sort of spreads out, you can see that basically what was inside the vesicle becomes the outside of the plasma membrane. And then all of your molecules will get ejected outside of the cell. That's the way you secrete neurotransmitters. That's the way you secrete things like insulin and things of that nature. So a lot of glands are doing this um, particular mechanism. Okay. So we kind of took a little bit of a parenthetical interlude there, right? Because we started off talking about parts of the nucleus or parts of the cell rather, right? So the structure of them and some of the function of them. And then we kind of took a little bit of a parenthetical pause and talked a little bit about transport and some activities of the actual membrane itself. And now we're kind of closing that parenthetical discussion and we're moving back to our structural discussion of the parts of the cell itself. We start off first of all with the nucleus and the endomembrane system. So the nucleus is important because it basically, of all the organelles, is the one that basically houses all of our genetics instructions in the form of DNA. And so your DNA is important because that basically is your um, is your lumps, it's like all the information you need to build you, right, from scratch. That's all the information that you got, pretty much all of it, right? Every little detail, every scrap, every little nook and cranny of information needed is in your DNA. And as a result, what we typically think of it as is we think of DNA as essentially the sequence that encodes your protein production. So for instance, when you're making a protein, 
and you're picking out that next amino acid in line, a lot of times the question comes up, how do you know, like, what sequence to pick in terms of your proteins, right? How do you know which amino acid to pick and in, in which piece? Uh, how do you know how to pick, like, say, alanine first, and then phenylalanine, and then tyrosine, and then glycine, and so forth, right? It's all in the DNA. The DNA is your instructions for building all of those amino acids. And that information is housed in the nucleus. So you can see the nucleus is basically kind of like your vault of all your genetic information. Okay, the complete set of plants. Now from this is what's called the endomembrane system, which is actually a series of organelles that essentially will process a lot of information. For instance, we just saw uh, the tail end of secretion, right? We just mentioned that exocytosis was the last step that you take when you're secreting something, which basically all that means is you're releasing a molecule outside the cell. That's all that means. So like if you're a neuron, a neurotransmitter will be secreted outside of yourself. So that's secretion. If you're a gland, you're secreting some sort of a hormone outside of yourself, that's secretion. So that's all driven by exocytosis. For exocytosis is the last step of what we refer to as the ex secretory pathway. And so the secretory pathway is what we're talking about when we talk about the processing materials for the cell. So basically it's tied together. All these organelles are tied together by the secretory pathway. And then when we kind of get all that together, I'll, I'll kind of show you quickly how that secretory pathway works. You already have the last step already with exocytosis and we'll take a look at the rest of it. But let's kind of drill down on the structure of the nucleus and kind of what it is. So first of all, we already said that the nucleus houses your genetic material. It houses it in the form of either chromatin or in the form of chromosomes. And so the DNA itself, when it's formed in chromatin, is just a long string of nucleic acid sequences, if you will, that are broken up into modular units called genes, and each gene controls a specific trait. So if you have brown hair, there's a gene for that. If you have blue eyes, there's a gene for that, right? So if you're tall, there's a gene for, genes for that, right? right? So all of your traits are governed by your genes. And of course you get your genes from your parents, which is the reason why we look like our parents because that's where we get our DNA from, right? Now within us, that's the organization of our information. It's kind of organized in these modular units called genes, but the structure of the DNA is a little bit different than what a lot of times people think, right? So first of all, we oftentimes we imagine DNA inside our nucleus as sort of being our little twisted rope ladder our ever famous twisted rope ladder, right? And so we have all these little DNA molecules sort of hovering about, swimming around in your nucleus, but actually those DNA molecules are very, very delicate. And so you have to protect them. So you don't just let them swim around on their own. You have to bundle them up with some protectors, some bodyguards, if you will. And that structure of sort of bundled or protected DNA is what we refer to as chromatin. Basically what you have is you have these protein complexes uh, made out of proteins called histones that form a drum-like complex. And you wrap your DNA around these little drum-like complexes. So what this basically does, each one of these little complexes is what we refer to as a nucleosome. So basically, that protects your DNA wraps them around these structural proteins, these histones, and kind of keeps your DNA a little bit protected so it's not sh uh, shredding and fracturing and things like that. We then further bundle up your DNA with more proteins into chromosome structures, especially when the cell is dividing, right? So what we do is we go through what's called chromosome condensations where they pack the chromosome down into a smaller tight package that's very similar to like taking some of our valuables when we're moving and packaging them to like these ultra padded, I would use the example of like packing your fine china to move from Charleston, South Carolina to LA, right? Cause that's like a coast to coast move. If that's your fine china and that's like a multi-family sort of a thing, irreplaceable, right? Air family heirloom type of a thing. 
you don't just let the movers handle that, right? Because half of what they touch breaks, right? You take that one on yourself and you are very meticulous about how you condense that collection down, aren't you? You bevel wrap every single individual piece. Like every single plate is individually wrapped with bubble wrap. So there's like no plate on plate clinking or anything like that. And then you put it in a box and you fill it with popcorn, right? Not like the kind you eat, but the packing popcorn. And then you tape the devil out of that, right? So that literally this thing is so well padded and protected, you could probably drop this out of an airplane and it would live, right? But that's what you did. You took your fine china collection and you condensed it down into a safe, ultra structurally packaged form so that it's protected. And that's exactly what you do when you start creating chromosomes and you're packing that up for dividing. So around your DNA, you have the fluid component of the nucleus, which is called nucleoplasm. And then an aggregation called the nucleolus, which is basically an aggregation of another nucleic acid called ribosomal RNA, rRNA. And ribosomal RNA is a structural component of ribosomes. So that's why they say it produces ribosomes. It's a structural component of ribosomes. And so you'll all see this in the nucleus itself. Now around the nucleus, you're gonna have an envelope, a membrane. It's a double membrane system that wraps around the nucleus. So you have an inner membrane, a space, and an outer membrane. And then in it, you have holes in the nuclear envelope for purposes of passage and transport called the nuclear pores, right? They operate very similar to like transport channels so that you can regulate what comes into the nucleus and goes out of the nucleus. And uh, let's just put it this way, because the nucleus is full of such sensitive material, right? I mean, this is like your brain trust. This is you, this is you in a DNA code, right? So the last thing you want to do is start screwing with your code. Because if we start screwing with your code, guess what that starts to do to you? We start to annihilate you. So it's like the universe knows how to destroy us. It's always going after our DNA. You destroy a building at its seminal design feet, at its design level, then the, the building will collapse. The building will be unstructurally sound, right? So that's the same thing what happens with us. So what do we do? We protect it at all costs. It's super, super sensitive information in there, right? So it, your, your, your presence in the nucleus is by invitation only. You don't just get to go waddle on in there and sightsee and take pictures of the nucleus and the chromatin and stuff like that. And the reason why I mention that is because there's definitely an image I have in my head. I always think of like the White House. Who owns the White House? Who literally owns the White House? Nope, the president doesn't own it. Yeah, assuming you're not like a tax evader, if you pay taxes, that belongs to you. The White House and everything in the government, the Capitol building, all of those, those belong to us, the taxpayers. It's our money that purchases all of that. It's our money that pays the president's salary. So actually we own the president. Now that may make you feel good or bad. I don't know. It depends on how you look at that. But right, I mean, there's a, you own a little piece of President Biden, right? And a little piece of the White House. We own it all, right? But here's the thing. We own it. So it's a public building, right? But Technically speaking, we have a right to it. But what happens if you just go cruising on into the White House? Taking pictures. We did this before, didn't we? It didn't work out very well, did it? It's called January 6th, right? We all waddled on in there like we owned the Capitol, which we do. But... Don't be surprised if when you attempt to put your feet up on the speaker of the house's desk that you just get shot. 
I can tell you right now, if they were stupid enough to do that at the White House, they would have gotten shot. Why? Because going to the White House and going to the Oval Office in particular is by invitation only. The number of Americans who have been on the inside of the Oval Office are very few. Why? We own it, don't we? It's ours. We paid taxes for it, didn't we? How come we can't just blow on in there like we just cruise on through our kitchen? What are we protecting? Or hiding, I guess, depends on how you want to look at it. <laughs> what are we protecting? Yeah, we're, we're protecting the president, right? That's why you get anywhere close to that White House. I mean, if they went January 6th on the White House, I guarantee you there would have been people who would have been gunned down by the Secret Service. Because you get anywhere close to the president and it is shoot first and sort it all out later. Right? That's their job. Their job is to keep our presidents alive. Right? So, and I mean, a good example of they, they're, them doing their job is the recent shooting on president or by or former president. Um, I, it's hard to know what to call him anymore. Right? I mean, when that happened, what was the first thing to happen? What we saw was on the stage, right? I mean, you saw the guy, the Secret Service guy from the back, jumping on and landing on President Trump. But what was happening over on the rooftop? The snipers were taking aim and taking them out. Shoot first, sort it all out later, right? So you, do, you don't want to get in the bad place with Secret Service, right? Because their job is to protect at all costs. But the president, in particular, is like the country's most valuable resource, right? This is the individual who's making the decisions for us, who's standing in our place, making the decisions that we want him to make or her to make, right? Um, and so those are important decisions. And so we have to make sure that that goes well. And we protect that particular individual. Same thing here. So your presence in the Oval Office is by invitation only. It doesn't matter if you're Joe Average. Like, I'm comfortable with the fact that I will never see the inside of the Oval Office. I'm okay with that. But it even goes to the senators. Say like, if Senate Hickenlooper, for instance, doesn't just get to cruise on down to the White House and go help them, you know, go open up the Oval Office and say, hey, Joe, how you doing? Right? They'll shoot him, too. Even if you're a Senator Schumer, who's like the top senator in the Senate and a member of Biden's own, and very close to Biden, doesn't have just free access to the Oval Office. So he only gets to go there when President Biden asks him to show up at the Oval Office. Why? Because you only have one chance at this. You screw up your most valuable resource and you are toast. You screw up your DNA and you are screwed. So you protect at all costs. Your entrance is by invitation only. So that's kind of what it looks like. So here you can see you have um, your chromatin, which is kind of all these little purple threads here that you see. Those are all the chromatin inside the nucleoplasm. This little ball here, they tried to sort of fuzz it out a little bit. This is the nucleus, right? This is that aggregation of ribosomal RNA. You typically see it looks kind of a little like it's, uh, like it's those edges are distinct and well-bounded. And that's not the case. It's just kind of like a blurry little aggregation, like a little spot that you see in the nucleus. That's what the nucleus is. All of that is bounded by your nuclear envelope, your double membrane system. So here you can see the outer membrane, the inner membrane, and then the space in between. And then these little um, nuclear pores you can see are basically those little openings or channels within which you can have regulated access to the nucleus. If you need to be in there, you're in there. If you don't, bye. Right. And then these little guys right here, you can see are actual ribosomes that are tethered to the nucleus, making proteins that are specific to the nucleus itself. Now, one of the important things to remember, and this is the reason why they bundle in the endomembrane system along with the nucleus, is because the first member of the endomembrane system is the rough, is the endoplasmic reticulum, which is this labyrinthine looking structure just on the outside of the nucleus. But the reason why they put it here 
is because the ER is actually kind of like an evagination. It's a continuation of the outer membrane of the nuclear envelope. So if you take a look at the outside of the nuclear envelope right here, you can see that you have an evagination of the membrane that then just basically falls back on itself. And it kind of creates a sort of long channel-like structure. Well, this little channel-like flap will itself evaginate and then it'll flap and fold down on itself and then so forth. It keeps evaginating and folding down, evaginating and folding. And then pretty soon you have this kind of labyrinthine-like structure, this maze-like structure that we refer to as the rough ER. So-called because on the surface of the rough ER are all of these little ribosomes that are basically studded on the surface. Okay, are right, you just gonna go ahead and crash? You're just gonna stay there. That are kind of like studded on the surface. That's why it's called rough. We'll take a look at that um, again in the future. Won't you actually get to the membrane, endomembrane system? Let's go ahead and do that. Or has PowerPoint completely frozen on me? It's completely frozen on me. Okay. And then of course, from the rough ER, we have more evagination where it kind of falls down and sort of creates this labyrinthine. It's a little bit different. It's not quite as labyrinthine. It's kind of more tubular in nature. This is the what's called the smooth ER. So it's a different extension. Smooth so-called because it doesn't have those ribosomes studded on the sides of it. Glad you asked that question. Perfect segue, actually. Right, so that gets us to the ribosomes and what they do. So basically, the function of the ribosome is protein synthesis. These guys are your factories. For making proteins. And they're composed of ribosomal RNA, which is in the nucleus, or in the nucleolus, rather. and the protein portion of the ribosome itself. Okay, this will form your factory. You can, uh, the nice thing about ribosomes is you can attach them to different places. For instance, if we attach them to the rough endoplasmic reticulum, uh, then they're making proteins associated with that particular organelle, the rough ER. They can be free floating out in the cytoplasm if we're making proteins that are gonna be functional out there in the cytoplasm. Um, typically when they're free floating, that usually means that these are proteins. They're going to be making proteins that are active in the cytoplasm. It's kind of like build on site, right? That's kind of what you're doing. Um, and when you do this, you can actually create, you can lump a bunch of these ribosomes together. And that's called polyribosomes. Um, and that's basically the free floating. But typically when they're attached to something, they're usually focused on proteins that are gonna be focused in, on that particular organelle. For instance, the ones that are attached to the endoplasmic reticulum are basically gonna be making proteins that are functional to the ER or to the nucleus. Remember we saw the little ribosomes attached to the member, outer membrane of the nucleus? those are gonna be making proteins that are gonna be active in the nucleus itself. So that's kind of like build on site. So that's basically what those guys are doing. Okay, let's take a look at our endomembrane system. We first of all, uh, properly start off with the nuclear envelope, right? Because that's basically kind of where this system starts. From that, 
you get that sort of evagination and then that kind of fold that fold back of the membrane it's basically just so big it just kind of collapses on itself kind of like a floppy chef's hat right um and so that creates your endoplasmic reticulum then you have the golgi apparatus the lysosomes and vesicles so these are all different organelles that are involved in this transport system and basically something that looks kind of like this so here you can see you have your nucleus with your er your rough endoplasmic reticulum in and around the nucleus itself. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to basically kind of move back and forth between the components of the endomembrane system and this image. So we can kind of take a look at like, okay, this is where we are, this is what's happening. The first place that you start is in the endomembrane system is with your rough ER. So your rough ER basically is studied with ribosomes and it means you're gonna be making proteins but you don't make all the proteins. Typically the rough ER will make three different types of proteins. The first one is secretory proteins. Secretory proteins. So things that you're destined to secrete outside of the cell, like a gland, for instance, making a hormone like insulin. The second one is going to be hydrolytic enzymes. What's a hydrolytic enzyme? It's an enzyme that does hydrolysis, digestion. These are digestive enzymes, okay? The third one are membrane proteins. So what's an example of a good membrane protein that we've seen? How about the receptors on receptor-mediated endocytosis? Remember, those receptors have to come from somewhere. The rough ER, the ribosome of the rough ER, makes those receptors and embeds them in the membrane itself. So those membrane proteins are made in the rough ER. Those are the only three it makes. The rest of them, other ribosomes have to make them um, and send them somewhere else. The other type of ER that you're gonna see, so those guys are in here down close to the nucleus. So you can see the rough ER with all these little ribosomes attached to it are making protein. That's what these little blue squiggles are. So that is basically crude protein that's being made and it's being made inside the lumen or the inside of the ER. So if you were to take a look at this in the rough ER, you would have your membrane here. Here's your ribosome. Here's the other rib. They'd be making your protein and it would be inside the lumen or the inside portion of the ER. So that would be your little protein that's inside there. The next step is a smooth endoplasmic reticulum, so-called because it doesn't have ribosomes. Its job has actually three different jobs. But number one is it synthesizes new lipids. So if you need new phospholipids at your membrane, your smooth ER is the place to go, okay? So it'll package up new lipids and it'll basically synthesize those and get those out there. The other two that it runs into is it'll detox, has a detoxing function. A good example of that is like um, detoxification of medication. So whenever you take a medication, um, your liver metabolizes it, and the way it metabolizes it is with enzymes in the smooth ER, right? So when you have like a um, kind of a dosage and a tolerance sort of a thing that you run into, right? So you get minimum dose to achieve therapeutic levels, but then what happens is that dose no longer does it for you anymore. And so what do they do? They increase the dose, right? So you get your therapeutic value back, and then what happens after that? You get a tolerance for that, right? And then they increase the dose. They, do, they don't do that infinitely, right? Because what's happening is you're building up a dependence on it. And so that's kind of the way it works. 
So essentially what happens is you build a tolerance for it. Why? Because there's enzymes that your liver puts into the smooth endoplasmic reticulum to detoxify that particular medication. Uh, this is what happens with alcohol as well. Has anybody ever heard the phrase, oh, that person really knows how to hold their liquor? All right, what does that mean? Yeah, that means they can drink an entire keg and still walk a straight line, right? Which is one of the reasons why I always kind of thought the sobriety, most of the, the street side sobriety tests were a little kind of eyebrow raising because it's like, um, you're not gonna catch that with a sobriety test because somebody who really has a high tolerance to alcohol can like put down like an entire keg and walk a straight line, right? Because what happens? Alcohol by your body is considered a toxin. So when you drink it, then what happens is your, your liver has uh, enzymes in the smooth end of plasma reticulum of the hepatocytes in there that will break down that alcohol into a less um, harmful byproduct. So the thing is, if you don't drink that much, just a little bit of alcohol will give you your little buzz. But if you keep drinking, what's going to happen is your liver is going to be like, oh, I see. So we're drinking this every day now, huh? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and pack your smooth endoplasmic reticulum with enzymes so that we can handle that. So then all of a sudden now, what, your one little drink doesn't do it for you anymore, does it? So what do you do? You drink a little bit more and you're like, oh, there's my buzz, right? Well, guess what happens? Your liver is like, oh, okay, so we're drinking a little bit more. So I'm going to add some more enzymes to your smooth endoplasmic reticulum. And then, of course, you lose that buzz. And what do you do? You drink more and more and more. Which is one of the reasons why I don't drink. I mean, some people could be like, oh, yeah, I just had a beer. I'm good. I can still drive. I'm like, no, I can't even do that because I don't drink at all. So like for me, one beer, I'll probably be passed out on the floor. It'd be like Doc Brown in uh, Back to the Future 3, right? I mean, he's already passed out and he hasn't even like drank his shot of whiskey. It's like he's just smell it and it's like you're, you're out, right? So I know for me, like if I even drank just like one drink, I would probably be, not, I mean, I'm, uh, it wouldn't be good because my body's not used to it, right? Whereas all my graduate student friends are all like oh yeah we can just drink you know 60 beers or whatever it's like okay that's not a good thing that's like that means you have a problem right, <laughs> right? that means you know if you can hold your liquor that used to be like a compliment that's not a compliment that's an indictment if you can hold your liquor that basically means you need to get help because your liver you've trained your body to not just tolerate that uh, high level of alcohol but to also rewire its physiology for that alcohol so when you stop drinking your body's like oh my god what do i do what do we do right so it's like that's the withdrawals that comes in because now all of a sudden your body doesn't know how to function because it's like wait a minute where's our alcohol right so that's where the withdrawal comes in so that's kind of what happens when you have detox and then the third one is for calcium storage. This is your muscle contraction. So in your muscle cells, you actually have uh, a type of smooth endoplasmic particulum called sarcoplasmic particulum that stores calcium. Calcium is part of your muscle contraction mechanism. So the third one, Golgi apparatus, is a flattened stack of cells. And its job will be to modify, to package, and to ship. That's typically the three system that I usually lay down. To modify, you have to sort it all out and you have to ship it all out. So think of it as sort of like the UPS of the endomembrane system, only in this case, it actually adds a little bit to it. Okay, So it has the ability to modify it. If you think about it, it's kind of like UPS, right? I mean, some of those boxes have been pretty highly modified not usually in a good way, right? It's like, or my favorite one, when Amazon delivered the package that had actually nothing in it. I'm all like, 
So does it ever register to you that this is undeliverable because there's nothing there? It's like, I guess not. Just deliver it and whatever. So those are the three main guys. And in between them, they're tethered with what's called vesicles, which are like little membrane bubbles, little membranous sacs that are used for transport. So before we get to lysosomes, I want to kind of cut a little line here because I want to talk a little bit now about how to place all this stuff on our image here. So when you take a look at this, what's going to happen is your ribosomes are busy making protein in your rough ER. Then what happens is that rough ER will basically bulge outward. It'll have your crude protein in it and it'll pop off to a transport vesicle whose job it is to go to the Golgi. And so what'll happen then is it'll float over to the Golgi, it'll dock with the Golgi, and it'll dump its crude protein contents into the Golgi, the lumen of the Golgi, where the Golgi will modify it, sort it all out, and ship it all out. So as it sorts it all out and modifies it, it starts to advance it forward. And then eventually what's going to happen is going to package that protein into its own little vesicle. It's going to bud that off just like a lava lamp. And now you have a secretory vesicle. In this case, it's full of your finished protein. And then from here, it's going to go exocytosis style, where it's going to fuse with the outer membrane and it's going to dump that finished protein to the outside world, right? So this is exocytosis. At that particular point, that's secretion. If you are a pancreatic cell, you are secreting or dumping insulin out there. If you're, an, if you're a neuron, that is a neurotransmitter that you're dumping out there, okay? So secretion basically has these basic steps to it. So this whole thing taken together, ties together this entire system, the endomembrane system. This is the secretory pathway. Now the problem is not everything that the ER makes is to be secreted, right? So for instance, in this particular case on this side, it's making a different type of protein. It's making digestive enzymes, in which case it basically will, um, and, and of course lipids, right? So you'll basically have um, digestive enzymes that are being made inside these cells and then they'll basically kind of shift up but then you don't secrete them you kind of do something else with them and so that's kind of one of the things on this side here you can see this is basically your lipid synthesis side you don't see this in a lot of textbooks but you do in this one it's kind of cool right if you're making a new lipid you basically make it in your smooth er because that's where we are over here and then you bundle this up and you transport it with this new lipid inside and you basically send that to your Golgi for modification and you incorporate it into the membranes and then ultimately what's going to happen is it's going to get shipped out and incorporated into the rest of the membrane. Notice all the membrane here on this secreted vesicle is all new membrane. So that becomes the outer membrane now. That is a new piece of membrane. So your, S, your smooth ER is able to make new lipids and embed them into the membranes and it's able to sort of shuffle throughout the, the cell that way. So one of the things that I want to do is quickly just to kind of show you an example of some alternatives that we have. For instance, not everything you're going to make is to be secreted. For instance, in lysosomes, which is another organelle, it looks exactly like a secretory vesicle, only the contents inside are different. In a lysosome, instead of holding secreted proteins, it holds hydrolytic enzymes. And the idea here is you don't let this one go because you don't want to secrete hydrolytic enzymes to the outside of the outside world. You'll be basically digesting yourself, which is a bad thing. Don't do that, All right? So what you do is you maintain this one and you hang on to it. And this basically creates kind of like your cellular stomach. It's like your cellular garbage disposal. it'll basically digest whatever you fuse it to. So for instance, here's another example. So here you can see are some enzymes over here. In this case, the Golgi has sorted them out, right? So these are the hydrolytic enzymes, not to be confused with the secretory enzymes. It's gonna be popping off in its own little vesicle and you hang on to that one. So this becomes the lysosome, not to be excreted, housing digestive enzymes. So remember when we talked about phagocytosis? 
when your cell gobbled some sort of a food particle up or your white blood cell gobbled up bacteria? Well, that's what's happening here. This is phagocytosis up there. So you basically suck in this little food particle. And then what you do in order to de devour it or to break it all up is you fuse it to a lysosome, which will then basically dump its digestive enzymes to the interior and start chopping up that, that food particle that you ate into little pieces. It's just like a cellular stomach, the exact same thing that has been happening in your stomach and your intestines. Hydrolytic enzymes being produced by your pancreas are chopping up the food that you eat. Just like hydrolytic enzymes in the lysosome are chopping up the food that the cell eats or engulfs. Notice, both these look the same from the outside. A lysosome looks exactly the same as a secretory vesicle. What differs between them is not the membrane that they are, the bubble, but what's inside them. And who determines what's inside them? The gold. That makes sense? Okay, so that's your lysosome. And then we will start with cytoskeleton next time.